from a human rights perspective. Why human rights in this debate of development and governance? Well, first of all, uh, we have a statement from the Secretary General's high level um, global sustainability panel which states that democratic governance and a full respect for human rights are key prerequisites for empowering people to make sustainable choices. And this has basically been said by the two colleagues on the panel earlier, is the involvement of parliament as representatives of the populations, representatives of the people, to involve people in, um, in making these choices. And second, the respect for human rights, to give a space for expressing, actually, one's voice. The, the, the human rights system, human rights instruments, have different options to which all states in the African Union are party to, at least of, to one of the instruments. We have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a General Assembly resolution. We have the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We have uh, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and we have, for instance, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. All these human rights instruments do open space and do provide uh, a guarantee that people have a right, a human right, to take part in government. We have the international obligations that the member states have taken. How can we align these global targets and goals? And how can they be tailored as needed at the national level and how can they be implemented? Now, if I may recall the global, the core human rights principles of universality, indivisibility, equality, non-discrimination, accountability, and participation, and inclusion, we already see the tools we have available to use human rights and to, to benefit from our human rights system when it comes to uh, development and to our post-2015 uh, development agenda. Universality means we need the human rights are available everywhere. All human rights for all everywhere. No separation between civil and political rights or economic, social and cultural rights as it's still sometimes used in academia. Equality, including equity and the need to address widening disparities as well as non-discrimination will be key, and we have discussed that this morning, will be key in achieving the goals we will be setting. If we take a human rights-based approach to development, our accountability question will translate into two issues. We will identify rights holders and we will identify duty bearers. And the duty bearers are those responsible to deliver on the rights. The rights that are already enshrined in treaties which you as parliamentarians have ratified in your respective national parliaments. So if we look now at these obligations of the duty bearers, that means if we want to hold the duty bearer accountable, the question to ask would be, how can you justify your policy choice? How can you justify the allocation of resources? Do you provide a fair delivery of services? Are your decisions transparent, objective, and public? And finally, have you actually identified the duties that you are obliged, that you, have, that you have committed to? And this requires mechanisms. Mechanisms that can provide benchmarking, monitoring, and reporting. And maybe the current human rights instruments that we have available and the current mechanisms we have available, for instance, your uh, periodic reports to the treaty bodies, uh, to the Human Rights Committee, to the Committee on Economic, Social, Social Cultural Rights, for instance, or the universal periodic review in which you also as parliamentarians are involved at the national level, can be tools that we could use and consider also in our um, when we when we look at the, the tw post-2015 development agenda. Violations of human rights that we encounter are to a certain extent always also related to development. Or if I may say so, the non-achievement of development goals turn out to become often violations of human rights.